Welcome to CMR Interviews by Jason Shapiro. In today's episode, Jason interviews Peter Brandt on mastering long-term trading success. To learn more about Jason and Peter, check the episode notes in the description. Okay. I love the name, Crowded Market Report. I love that. Thanks. So today is March 7th, 2024. I'm Jason Shapiro with Crowded Market Report. Today, I have the pleasure nay the honor of speaking with uh mr peter brandt who is somewhat uh, of a legend in this in the in the world of trading and he has agreed to speak when i think it's going to be really cool so uh, and the thing that i really like about it is peter has been around for a very long time um he's traded for a very long time had a lot of experiences which cannot be replaced um and has had a lot of successes and has had failures along the way and his trade and he's been successful and his trading is different than my trading he's more of a breakout sort of technical trader which i am not sort of a momentum trader which i am not i'm almost the opposite of that in certain ways and yet when i read his chapter in market wizards and I, and i read some of the things that he talks about the things that he talks about that make you a successful trader are quite frankly the same exact things that I talk about, despite the fact that our, our process is, is very, very different. So that's always good for me. Um, and, and it's also always good for me to speak to somebody who does something different than I do, because that's how I learn. So I'm glad he's here and Peter, uh, welcome for welcome. And, and thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I think, Technically, you're supposed to be dead before you be you, you. You're identified as a legend, so don't rush the process. I'm old enough as it is. Legend to be. Yeah, yeah. Or hopefully, not too soon then. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, I I don't know. You're probably in your fifties. Fifty six. You're just such a young pop. I can't believe it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I I like to think that age is relative to how long you're going to make it. So in those terms, I am not, I'm very old because I, I don't think I got too much time left. But. Yeah, well, I kind of feel that way myself, but, you know, I'm I'm <laughs> fast charging on 80. So Good for you, man. Yeah, I mean, I was born just two years after World War II ended, so. You caught a good run. Yeah, I mean, I've been trading, it's going to be... Um, my first trade in futures was in the summer of 1974. So this this can be 50 years. This year was a go that I made my first futures market trade. That was in silver coin bags of silver coins. Silver hadn't really started trading yet. Well, that's awesome. And you know the experience. The truth is, I I say this with a lot of things is the one thing that you can't really go back and get. You know, we were, I was talking to somebody the other day about uh, a, a buddy of mine who's been trading. He, he's probably about your age. He's probably older than you. And he started trading on the Amex. And the guy was like, oh, you know, Ron's such a good trader because blah, 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 blah. I go, listen, Ron's such a good trader because he started trading on the Amex 60 years ago. OK, and you can't replace that. You can't replace 60 years of experience. Right. You can try. But experience is a big part of anything. Right. I always say instinct is a function of experience, right? You're not born with instinct. You learn it through experience, right? And you can't replace that. And, and I think it's the same thing with you. You can't replace the experience that you have, you know? Yeah. I mean, I I traded on the floor with guys that were born before the roaring 20s. I mean, we're talking World War One period. You know, World War One veterans were in the pits. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Not to date myself much, right? <laughs> right. I can yeah, just hear crazy. all these. Uh, I can hear all these, like you know, twenty-three-year-old guys that are crushing it on ODT options every day. Listen to this, going, "Okay, I've had enough of this with these two old farts." But whatever. Yeah. We will try, despite us being old farts, we will try to impart some of the wisdom that maybe we will uh, we have picked up over the years. Yeah. So you let me uh, let me start with this question to you. What does it take to make money over time trading? I, there's so many ways. There's so many places to go on that. And there's so many directions I could go to even answer that that would be slightly the same, but somewhat nuanced. I mean, for one thing, the first thing you got to do is not lose money, right? I mean, 
before a person, hey, I'm not talking about this crypto, right? Guys coming in and buying these crack coins and, you know, they're, they multiply their account 50 times the first year and they think they're geniuses. So, I mean, cryptos have kind of changed the name. I mean, I could answer that question pre-crypto or I could answer it post-crypto. And I'm going to answer it pre-crypto. Because quite frankly, I think all the guys that have, these young guys are making all this money in crypto now are going to eventually lose it. So, um, or a lot of them will. I mean, there, there'll be some of them. But the ones that don't lose it are the ones that figure out how to at least not lose money, right? Before you make money, you got to figure out how not to lose money. And so how do you protect your your your, your pile of chips? Uh, how do you take small losses? So that's what I tell somebody. The first thing is if you is you, you're going to have to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to have to climb a, a a steep wall. It's it's a huge learning curve. Uh, but you're going to have to figure out. Uh, it's easy to make money in markets. It's it's hard to keep it. And you got to figure out the hard to keep it side first, unless, you know, you happen into some wacko altcoin and it's your first trade and it goes from 20 cents to 20 bucks. I mean, so I'm, you know, I'm talking about normal people who want to trade for a long period of time because I don't really care if somebody is a one year, two year, three year wonder. It doesn't really mean much to me. I mean, what what means something to me is guys that are marathon traders. They're they're in it. They're in it for a long period of time. They they, they say this is how I want to make my money. I want to be a career trader. It's what I want to do. It's what I want to do for a living. I want to do it now. I want to do it twenty years from now. And uh, and so I want to make my living and build my wealth as a trader. All of a sudden, you're in a marathon run instead of a sprint and so uh, as a marathon runner the first thing you need to do is when you have a loss you need to take it and at least hold your account together because it's going to take you three to five years to even pick up the scent on what you eventually want to do so you can't uh, with the rare exception maybe less than one percent of people who start down the road of trader trading it's that those that succeed, it's going to take them three to five years to kind of figure it out. There'll be a few people who get it right away, but not very many. But the vast majority of the minority of people who make it as a trader, it's a, it's a five years of bruises and cuts and wax across the head. And then you kind of have it figured out and have a chance. It was 10 years for me before I even figured out what the hell I was trying to do. Um, just for the record, I'm a slow learner, apparently. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was 10 years before I, I really had to sit down. 10 years of, you know, making a lot of money, losing a lot of money, making a lot of money. The typical thing that the yo-yo that people go through before I actually sat down. I was like, okay, I'm 10 years into this and I'm back to scratch. And so I have to make a decision here. You know, if this is how I'm going to try to make my living, I got to sit down and really figure out what the hell is going to work over time instead of how I'm going to make a bunch of money this week and lose a bunch of money next week, you know. Yeah, uh, that that took that was a ten year process for me. Yeah, I mean, like I said, my first trade's nineteen seventy four, so that's fifty years ago, and I don't think my first really good year in the markets where I was really able to build an account and take money out was probably late nineteen eighties. And I'm not late late 1980. I mean, so in 81 was my first monster year. So, you know, it's seven years, seven years to my first monster year. So yeah. and, I had the unfortunate experience of um, starting when I was about 22 or 23 and was caught up in a massive bull market. And I say unfortunate experience because I was young and stupid and just buying things on massive amounts of leverage and very quickly uh, made a lot of money. And therefore, that sort of set the tone for me um, to believe that I was some kind of genius um, and knew what I was doing. And so clearly, 
inevitably all that money that I made um, was lost, you know? Um, yeah. I feel like it's we used to s- you start out losing money because then you, you learn, uh, you learn just how dangerous this can be. Yeah. Either I mean, way, we used to say at the money. board of trade that you, you actually want your first trade or two to be losers. Because yes. if you come right out of the box with a big winner, you're in big trouble. That's right. That was the story of how I started too. Um, so yeah, either way, it, it's a problem. And you know, it, it always makes me think of ninety nine. In ninety nine, you know, and I try to be, you know, Mister Contrarian, right? And and I, you know, I'm a big believer that the vast majority of people over time are going to lose money. And if I can figure out what the vast majority of people are doing over time, if I can take the opposite side, then I can take the money that they're going to lose. It's not going to work all the time, just like nothing works all the time. But over time, that should work in my view. In late 99, when everybody was walking around the streets talking about how much money they were making, you know, it was pissing me off so much. I just kept shorting the market because I knew that it was going to it was going to end badly. But in the meantime, the market went up another 50 percent in four months, you know, and these people did make a bunch of money. But in the end, you fast forward to 2002. They lost all that money. So the fact that they paper traded, you know, I knew one kid, he had like $15 million. You know, he was making $60,000 a year in his job and he had $15 million in stock, right? And he lost it all, you know, but for a while there, it looked great. And and I feel like, you know, a lot of people have been doing that. Um, and this is where I say experience counts for something. A lot of people I feel like have been doing that with NVIDIA. Oh, my neighbor buys all this NVIDIA and he's making all this money and he's a freaking moron. I'm going to short it. Okay. What I'm telling you is your neighbor will lose that money eventually. It doesn't mean there's not a time period where he can make a lot of money. And the more money he makes doing this, the more he's going to lose later. Right. And that's a very hard part about being contrarian is, and it's a very hard part about all trading, I think is the word patience you know you have to be patient these things do happen as they're supposed to happen but you have to be patient otherwise you'll get run over in the meantime too yeah i i remember it really made an impact on me probably 76 77 uh and i think i blew out i don't know how many accounts three accounts four accounts i can't remember but i remember a bit a really nice profit i took in soybeans probably the first really decent trade i had 76 77 and i remember mentioning it to a trader from cargill an old seasoned guy who looked at me and said youngster you hold on to that money for me will you because i may be coming around to ask for it you know, and I'm kind of going, whoa, that 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 speaks a whole lot. You know, I there I wrote down, Jason, I reread the chapter in Market Wizards that you're in. Uh by the way, congratulations for being a market wizard. I know personally what Jack asks of us to be in the book. And uh he 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 asked for an awful lot of accountability. But I went through there. And I couldn't believe the number of things we had in common. Uh, I mean, like I, I was saying in the beginning, it's all, it, it to me, it doesn't matter how you trade. Yeah. It really, it really doesn't flip a coin for all I care about. Um, it, it's all about these other lessons that are that are the important things that I I, I, I did read the chapter last night that you were in. And um, like I said, I, I, was, I started off, I thought, oh, maybe I'd highlight some things that we could talk about on here. And I stopped because... The whole interview, I, I would have had to highlight the whole thing because everything you said is exactly what I have learned. Everything that I know is exactly what you have said. And, and I learned it, quite frankly, by interviews on some of the other Market Wizards books and Market Wizards 1 and 2. A- everybody says, everybody who is successful says the same thing, you know? Um, yeah. Which yeah, are these you know, lessons? It one, doesn't one matter thing how you that I had forgotten about when I first read was that you had a connection to Commodities Corp. Now, it was after I had uh, had been involved in Commodities Corp because I took a big hiatus in the market from 95 to uh, 2006. I had no involvement in the market. I had burnt mm. out. 
terribly bad. I really burnt out mid nineties. And that's about the time that, that commodities corp sold itself to, uh, it's Goldman Sachs and Goldman moved it to London and ruined it. Quite frankly, they ruined the company. They did. Yeah. Totally ruined it. And it became a disaster for guys like me because it was just so different. But then you got involved in it because you somehow got to know Helmut. I, um, I, I left the job. I was pretty broke. My wife hated me. We were going to get the, Forced. I went to a. I lived in Lawrenceville, right next to Princeton. I went to randomly a a divorce lawyer. He asked me what I did. I said I'm a trader. He asked me if I knew Helmet. I said I knew of him. I don't know him. I didn't even know he was still alive. He told me that his wife was best friends with Helmet's wife, and I said that's great. If you want to be my divorce lawyer, then get your wife on the phone and tell her to call Helmet's wife right now and get me a meeting with Helmet. And the next morning, I was sitting in the in Helmut's office in, in Commodities Corp, which at that point had been bought by Goldman, but uh, was in the middle of just switching over. And Helmut still had, had his office there. Was he in the Was he in the mansion? Yes, big fireplace and all that. Yeah, big, that was an amazing building. Yeah, it was an amazing place. So, and and Helmut, um, as it turned out, I told him how I trade. He 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 got it right away. Um, he gave me some money to manage and he brought me into Goldman and had them match um, what he had given me, which wasn't a lot of money, a few million dollars, but I was kind of off and going at that point. But more importantly, I don't know how you didn't work in the building, right? You were off site. Well, I was outside. I was in, I was in Chicago and right. then ended up in Minnesota. So, I mean, more importantly to me um, was helmet. Um, I got to know him very well. I lived in Lawrence. I, you know, I lived three miles from his house. Um, and he is to me, one of the, one of the greatest people I've ever met, quite frankly. Um, not only from his brain perspective, super smart guy, but from his life outlook perspective, um, it really helped change my life outlook quite a bit and guides me to this day on on decisions that I make and things that I do and what motivates me. You know, Helmet didn't need to, uh, you know, this was like 2001. He didn't need to give me money to manage. You know what I mean? Guy didn't need to give anybody money to manage because he had more money than anybody was ever going to use for the rest of their lives, right? Um, he didn't need to, to sort of take me under his wing in a way and, and teach me about things in life and be sort of a a father figure you know he didn't really teach me a lot about trading you know but he mentored me in a lot of other ways um and he didn't need to do any of that uh and it had an incredible it was the first time anybody really ever did that to me um so it, it really had an, an an incredible effect on me on how and, and you don't get this when you're younger. You, I think you only get this when you start getting older and you start looking back on your life and you start thinking about what you did with this time on earth, right? Giving back to people is, is an incredibly important thing to do in this life, I find. Um, something I never even thought about. When I was 30 years old, I wasn't looking to give back. I was looking to take, man. Take mm -hmm. as much as I could. I wanted to be a billionaire and I wanted to, you know, blah, 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 right? And that's fine. But as you get older and you start thinking about some other things, um, you, you're, you're thinking about what you can give back, and, and that's what Helmet did to me, and that I believe that that passed down that whole um, thought process to me, at least now, it took a while, um, that I, I should do the same. But anyway, this interview is not about me, but that, that's the biggest effect that that Commodities Corporation had on me, what was my relationship with Helmet. Yeah, well, you know, because it, it, indirectly, he was also my entree in because uh, prior to that, I was clearing uh, – Louis. I, I had a good relationship with Louis Trubner, who was all on the Cocoa Exchange Board of Governors with Helmet. Right. And I was clearing my trades through Louis Trubner, and he was doing my execution in Cocoa. And then I ended up at the Board of Trade helping to set up a clearing corporation 
uh, for Gill and Devil Services, and they were a huge cocoa broker. And so they also had a lot of contacts and knew Lewis. And of course, Lewis was probably one of the world's experts on trading cocoa, world's experts on cocoa. I mean, that was his market. That was that was that was his thing. Uh, was was doing that doing that. The other thing, uh, probably for me, after Commodities Corp was because they were really the only outside money I've traded. I, you and I are in common like that, is that we really don't have a lot of interest in trading other people's money, right? I mean, Well, I, I, I do trade, trade other people's own. money. No, I, I have a CTA, and, uh, and, and I do trade other people's money, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, I've gone. Uh, I've gone through periods back and forth, but uh, the last five six years, um, I I restarted the CTA and, and and took in you know a few uh, institutional clients who I had known over the years, and and I do manage other people's money now. Yeah, you know, you know, I'm I'm interested. I really want to dig in your brain a little bit on commitment to traders has always been important to me, but not a primary importance, right? I mean, I'm I'm always aware of it, but I'm mostly aware of it when I know that we've kind of reaching extremes, like you've got extreme positioning. But I, I could really care less what the small spec does. Well, sometimes if the small specs really gets weighted one way or the other, but I'm more interested in, in the hedge funds and the commercials and when you get extreme levels, like right now, as we speak, we have some really extreme levels in the grains where the commercials are like all time record net longs in the soybean complex, hedge funds, all time net shorts in the soybean complex. And I prefer to trade on the side. I want to trade on the side of the commercials in those cases. But I don't really pay much attention to COT week to week to week to week. I, you know, I want to know number one: Do you have an historic extreme uh, on on the positioning? And number two: Do I see anything on the chart that supports the idea that the commercials are going to probably give back a lot of the money they lost in the preceding trend? Because, you know, whenever you have a large, super large commercial short position, uh, that usually indicates that that market had been trending up. And when you have a huge commercial long position, chances are you have a market that had been in a, an extreme downtrend. And so I'm interested in trying to find the turn where I think for me, I need more of a turn than you need before you pull the trigger. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I use the commitments of traders to do exactly that. I look for massive extremes as a window to a possibility of a market turn. I think what I have found um, is that a lot of times at market turns, commitments of traders is showing extremes. However, a lot of times when commitments of traders is showing extremes, doesn't necessarily mean the market's going to turn, okay? And that's where people get it wrong, you know, and that's why people don't like the commitments of traders. Um, but it's just like anything else. You, you could just take an RSI, right? A lot of times when a market turns, the RSI is very high. But there's a lot of times when the RSI is very high that a market doesn't turn. I mean, all, all oscillators are kind of like that, right? All mean reversion. All I'm doing with this commitments of traders, instead of mean reverting price, I'm mean reverting positioning, right? Yep, yep. Um, but, you know, you have to be extremely, extremely patient because it can be that way for a long time, A. And B, it can also switch very quickly. You know, you were talking about cocoa, and I've given this example a few times, but I was showing an extreme positioning in cocoa last July, okay? And therefore, I've been watching cocoa basically very actively since last July, which makes me think of Helmet because, as you know, Helmet literally wrote the book on cocoa. Right. Yeah. You can look up the book on Coco and you'll find his book. Right. So I've yeah. been thinking about him a lot because of that. But, you know, it was showing extreme in July of last year. I took a short. I got stopped. And then the extreme went away. 
So for whatever reason, the speculators weren't getting longer into the market going up. They were actually selling out of that. And so that stops me from trying to short it again because it's not extreme anymore. And you look at what Coco's done. It's gone from where I was starting to short it, somewhere around 3,300 um, to you know 6,500 6, we're at now, right? Um, so what the commitments a trader can also do I have found, I always like to say it's not necessarily a great predictor of markets, but is a great risk manager. It keeps me out of trouble. It has kept me from shorting Coco this, on this run from 32 to 65 because it has not been extreme. It has kept me from shorting the stock market this entire run up as much as I can sit here and make the argument that NVIDIA is ridiculous and blah, 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 blah right? It's kept me from doing all that. And a lot of times, keeping you from losing money is just as valuable as helping you make money, right? Um, so that's another thing that it helps me do. Uh, another thing that it can help you do as a trend trader is stay in trends that are not crowded, right? And get out of trends that are crowded, you know? Yep. It can help you do that as well, right? If you had been long cocoa and you're nervous because it's going up, you know, we all have this problem. Oh my God, it's so much in the money. I should take my profit. I should take my profit. Well, it could have helped you kept you in because it's not crowded. So let it ride, man. You know, let these non-crowded trends ride. And it helps a lot with that too, you know? I, um, and again, I want this interview to be about you and not me, but I, as a businessman, run a CTA that offers this sort of counter-trend stuff that gives negative correlation to the fund of funds who I manage money for. They have a lot of money in trend following and these type of things. My stuff will be negatively correlated to that, which it's easier to put a, neg a negatively correlated thing on because you just go opposite what every trend follower is doing. But that doesn't add value to anybody. I'll make when they lose. I'll lose when they make. It doesn't add any value. They could just reduce their their investment in trend following and do the same thing, right? Um, but what I tend to do, hopefully, is I don't really lose a lot of money when they're making a lot of money. And then hopefully when the things turn and they start to lose, I make. That's the value that I add. And it's been a, the one of the greatest examples of, and, and I have been saying that to the people who follow me and the people who who are on my newsletter. And it's hard for them to see that until time passes. Because, okay, they see that we, we had a couple real good years the last two years. And so they say, oh, this works, this works, this works. You know what I mean? They're trying to copy trade me, which I tell them not to do, but whatever. I can't tell them what to do. But the last three months now, I haven't had a single trade. That's never happened to me before. Wow. In 24 years of doing this this way, I've had a total, I went and looked back, a total of two months out of the market totally. Not even two months in a row. A total in 24 years of two months out of the market now i've had three months completely out of the market never happened to me before which a has been a, an extreme test for my discipline which has been great but b look at what happened in that period trend following is crushing it right you're talking about some of these trend forwards up 15 20 percent in the last three months and i'm yep. flat okay and what kept me flat was i wasn't just fading these trends for the hell of it right the COT was telling me it's not time to fade it because they're not crowded, which to me is why the trends continued and kept me from shorting them. So it, again, the COT didn't make me money in that situation, but it stopped me from losing any money in what theoretically should be an environment where I should be losing a lot of money. So that's a, incredibly valuable to me. So that's mm -hmm. what COT is. It's just like everything else, not perfect. When it works, it works great. All the things that you've talked about, right? When it works, it works big, and it gives you a chance to take small losses. And that's what this game is all about, as you know. Let me let me ask you a question uh, on your trading. I know that for me, you're in and you're out. I mean, it's really predictable. Um, you're in and you're out. If I look at all the trades I did, and then I know how much I made. Let's, you know, I, I know the net amount. I know my net profit at the end of the year. I report it marked to the market to the IRS. And if I figure out what the composition of trades were that represented that net profitability, it's almost every year I find that 10 to 15% of my trading events will equal 90 to 100% of my net profitability. So it's kind of a Pareto effect, right? It's the old Pareto, 20% uh, 
of events gives eighty percent of outcomes, and I found that true in my trading. And just curious about you whether you have found something similar in your trading. Hundred um, percent. In twenty four years, thirty six percent of my trades make money. Um, it tends to be at a four to four and a half times my losses on the winners. So that's what I'm trying to do. Lose one, lose one, make four, lose one, lose one, make four, lose one, lose one, make four. That's yeah. the average. But yes, 20%, 36 may make money, but it's somewhere between 15 and 20% of my trades will make me 80% of my profits over time. And yeah. I never know what those are going to be. You know, I know I never know when they're going to come. You know, if I did, obviously things would be a lot easier. It's just not how life works. Um, but yes, it, it's right along the same lines. And I, and I think that's true for anything. Yeah. The other, you know, a couple other things I've found, Jason, yeah, even, you know, again, relative to this Pareto type thing that happens, is that there'll be trades that I really get excited about. I mean, I try to be neutral. I, I don't like getting emotionally high. I don't like getting emotionally down. I really work hard at trying to stay centered trying to stay emotionally neutral, not getting too excited. But nevertheless, the reality is I'm a human being, and there are That's some right. trades I do that I kind of i am hopeful. You know, I am excited about this is one, this is going to be one. And that more of it, you know, it seems like more often than not, they fizzle. And that some of the, my best trades every year are trades that when I put them on, at the point of onset of the trade, I really had low low expectations of it. It's, it's like I would have never thought this was one that was going to deliver. You find the same thing with yourself? A hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. And, and I think at this point I've done a, like you say, I'm human. I do have emotions, right? I'm not a robot. But I, I think I do a pretty good job, hopefully, of, of getting rid of those emotions and, and just treating these things like... A machine you know people say like now I, okay you put a trade on oh well, what do you think the chart doesn't look good to this doesn't. i go I, I don't know man I, I don't know i'm either gonna get stopped okay and lose what i expected to lose or it's gonna work <laughs> you know what i mean i i have no idea other than that you know oh but what about this what about that i'm like i i have no idea about any of the things that you're talking about okay i know one thing i got the trade on because this is how i trade i have a 38 percent chance that it's going to work okay I have a, whatever the rest of that is, a 62% chance that it's not going to work. It's going to be one of the other. And that's, that's all it is, man. You know, that's all, that's all I know. That's all, that's all I know. And clearly I spent a lot of time paying attention to stuff and reading and listening and all that. So I can pretend like I know a lot more than that and I can talk about stuff. But the truth is, that's really all I know, man. And, and that's all I want to know. Yeah, so let's say 38%. I'm higher than that, but I think I'm higher than that because I tend to be a momentum trader, right? You're trying to pick the turns, and it's, so it's completely understandable that you'd be at 38, 39, 40% because you're trying to pick the turns and you get out quickly when you're wrong and uh, where I at least try to get momentum, but in the process of giving, get waiting for momentum, I give up half the move. Um, which is true. I mean, when I put a trade on, I'm sense. just assuming I've given up half the move. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, that all makes sense. None of this is, is illogical. It's a hundred percent logical. You know I mean? That's exactly how it should work based on what I do. That's exactly how it should work based on what you do. That's exactly how it should be. You know, people are like looking for these magic bullets and, and they don't exist. You know, things are pretty efficient, right? If you're a trend trader, then your returns and your expectations should look like what you're doing, right? Yeah. If you're a counter trend trader, then your returns and the expectations per return per trade should look like what I'm doing. Because that's yeah, what you, it is. You you know, you mentioned that, you know, you were the second chapter in the Market Wizards book that you wanted to be third because Bruce Kovner was the third chapter. Yes, and he's and my it's idol. interesting when you said that <laughs> is if I had to pick my all time hero as a trader. Right, yeah, it would be Bruce Kovner. Yeah, he's my man. He's he, my man. I met him once. Helmet, helmet hooked me up with him, and I sat with him for about an hour, a couple hours. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Uh, I mean, just 
why in you know everyone talks about Paul Tudor Jones not to take anything away from Jones ever you know or Marcus or whatever the name might more whatever the name might be yeah but Kovner to me was the stud of all times you know pure, man. He, he was he he's was pure, my goat yeah he was a pure trader mine too and you know what he said to me when I met him we talked for a long time and I was talking about the possibility of going to work for his firm at the time when I was completely unemployed, which all of a sudden I could go work for, you know, Caxton, which at the time was 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 grade A hedge fund. Um, yeah. And I didn't get the job because his COO, Peter De D'Angelo, didn't like me at all. I don't know if you ever met Peter. You probably yeah. did. But he, he was kind of a hard ass and uh, he didn't he didn't like me or my attitude, but whatever. But Kovner, the only thing he said about trading, he said, how do you trade? I said, yeah, you know, I'm looking for the COT and I'm looking at everybody be on one side and I'm, blah, I'm going the other way. And the only thing he said, he goes, you know, yeah, that could work if you if you use the right discipline. That's all he yeah. said. Yep. Well, and that's a unique thing. And that's that's the thing that anyone who's read the Marco Wizards series realizes there's really there's really two themes in all the Marco Wizards books that I've read. The first theme is Every single person traded trades differently. There, there, there are no. You don't mirror anybody. You don't. You can't be a copycat. You got to develop your own thing. And you know, Jack. You know, Jack. I'm trying to remember what he said. He's like interviewed whatever seventy two people. I'd say whatever. Every single one trades differently. And then the thing that you get out of market wizards is people don't refer to themselves as traders as much as they refer to themselves as risk managers. They're risk managers. First and foremost, they manage risks. That's what they do. You're dealing in an unknown future. Yeah. I don't care who you are. You can't see the future. You're dealing in an unknown future. So what, what you have to be doing is managing risk, not predicting future. This is my, my one of my mantras, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I say... When people call me market wizard, you know, it's kind of irritating, right? It's such a queer yeah. thing just because you're in a book. But I say, listen, if I'm a market wizard, okay, it's because I know how to take losses better than other people. That 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 is it. That's it, you know? And the only reason I know how to take losses better than other people is because I've taken so many of them in my life, okay, that I have learned how to take them well, right? But that that's it. That's the difference between a market wizard and, 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 and not a market wizard. The ability to take losses. Yeah. And you mentioned your ratio and I, I, mine's probably similar. I think over the last, whatever, nine years, my average winner has been 70 basis points. My average loser has been 20, you know, minus 20. Um, so yeah, you just, you, you, it's, it's all in people ask me my win rate and I go, I don't have a clue. I could care less. Or the 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 obsession with the sharp ratio absolutely blows my mind. Uh, you know, if you talk to anybody in a family that run in a family office, the first thing they want to know is what's your sharp ratio. Yeah. Is yeah. if I could care less what my sharp sharp ratio is. I know. I, I went through. I don't know my sharp ratio. I've never figured out my sharp ratio. I think Jack has. No, it's a it's a silly number. And uh, yeah, I went through a lot of years where I was raising money, and uh, that would always be the question. And these guys, all they wanted to do, they only want to hire people that have a sharp ratio of three. That's That was their thing. Anybody with a sharp ratio of three, they'll hire. I'm like, okay, but what about if they're all correlated, man? You know what I mean? Then when they go bad, they're all going to go bad. Like, well, what kind of way to put a portfolio together is that? <laughs> it's so ignorant. well. The the other thing too, as you know, Jason, a lot of these guys with these big sharp ratios, uh, you, you know, are short gamma traders. They're of course, and they're they're just waiting to get run over by a steamroller. Of course, that's what I'm saying, and that's what happens. And even if they're not short gamma traders by definition. They're short gamma traders by return stream. So they might not be shorting gamma, but their returns are going to just look just like someone who's shorting gamma. So yeah, when all their, their sharp ratios of three get hit, they're all going to get hit together. Yeah. You know, the the interesting thing is, you know, you, if I get together with guys for one reason or another, I go to a meeting or whatever, and there's a bunch of traders that are relatively new in the trading game. 
or they want to be traders. And, you know, they ask me questions like, you know, what length of moving average do you use or do you use RSI or do you do this or do that? Those are the questions they want. That's what they want to talk about. And I know from meetings I was at with Commodity Corp guys and guys from the Board of Trade, they get together as traders and they talk about things like, uh, my wife hates it because I'm a trader and I can't give her a family budget. How do you do that? You know, or... You know, my my dog knows my dog knows immediately when I walk in the door if I had a bad day. Right. Those are the things real traders talk about. Oh my God. It's so damn true. You know, I'm I'm married twice now, okay? And you know, being married in this profession, right? Um, it can be very difficult if you're not with the right woman, right? And I wasn't with the right woman the first time. Yeah. And I have always not always, but once I learned, you know, lived my life in a way so that as much as possible, money didn't matter Yeah. so that I didn't have to cover a monthly nut. You know what I mean? Like I never in my first marriage bought a house. I could never afford to buy a house unless I could buy a house for cash, which means I could never afford to buy a house. So I rented and that gives women and everything sort of a very uncomfortable feeling, right? And I would never buy, you know, fancy car, any car that I couldn't pay for cash, I wasn't buying, right? And even if I could pay for cash, I would still buy a car worth half that amount because then I could put the other cash in a bank account and, and have a reserve. You know, I always lived that way. And so my first wife could never handle that. Um, my second wife, God bless her, I met when I took a break from trading for about a year and a half. Um, I closed down my, what I had a CTA then, I bought a farm and I was going to go live like the Thoreau life for a while and <laughs> i say that i was going to live the thorough life i bought this like you know farm and it had a big uh thing in the back where you could uh throw the wood in and it would heat the whole home and all that you know one of these outdoors sort of heated and the first day i went out there i'm like oh man i'm gonna do it and I, I chopped wood and i swear the second chop i threw out my back i was in bed for three weeks so that was my thorough life but the point is you know and i met my current wife during that period and i i had some other businesses that i invested in and, and everything was fine but um, I, I was going to get back into trading and I sat her down and I said, listen, and she doesn't know anything about it. You know what I mean? I said, listen, I'm thinking about getting back into this, but you got to understand, you know what I mean? You, you just got to understand that, uh, it, it's extremely emotionally taxing you know? <laughs> and my moods, I try very hard to keep them, but you're going to know, you know what I mean? You're going to yeah. know. Oh, I totally, I, and I wasn't joking about the dog thing. Right. No, I know. No, you're you're a hundred percent on. You're a hundred percent on point. That that it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever said. Someone starts asking about moving averages and all that, whatever. Someone asks me questions like that, I know they're going to be a trader. That, that's 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 awesome. Which brings me to a funny point that you say that this is so perfect because I said to these guys on my uh, on my Discord, and a lot of them follow you, and a lot of them have a big admiration for you. And I said, I'm going to be talking to Peter Brandt. Does anybody have any questions? So the first one was, what advice would he give to his past self or somebody new that wants to get into trading? Uh, and you're going to second, you're gonna laugh at the second question, but go ahead, answer. I Don't. <laughs> you know what the one I tell everybody is when they ask me that? Go to law school. Uh, yeah, well, I, I <laughs> wanted to go to law school as a matter of fact, but um, I had taken, University of Minnesota had a mandatory language requirement. And I have enough trouble with English, much less another language. So I had three semesters of fail in French before I finally got through it. I had to take a course, fail it, and then pass it, fail it, then pass it, then fail it, and pass it. Those 15 credits of fail were enough that then combined with my SAT score, I came up short in my application to law school because of the French fails. Mm. Uh, you know, otherwise I might have been a lawyer and I'm kind of glad I wasn't. I, I'm glad I, you know, Jason, maybe you like this. I pinch myself sometimes when I think, my God, I've been able to support my family, live the life I live for almost 50 years for, as a trader. What a crazy thing. How crazy is that? 
Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of ups and downs, and I had periods where I was dead ass fucking broke. While people that were friends of mine who at one point had actually worked for me were making, you know, a lot of money. And but yes, now I do, and my wife reminds me very often um, how incredibly blessed that I am. Um, yeah. That I, I get to do now. It took very many years. Okay, it took a long time, and people are like, "Oh man, you're so lucky." I'm like, "Oh yeah." Go live my freaking life for the last 35 years and see how lucky I am, okay? But I am now at a point, yes, I consider myself very blessed. That I get to do what I love to do. I do it right here in my living room, okay? I My wife is into art. Her her, her art is right there. She's 15 feet away from me. I, I love her, her to death. We get to spend time together. I don't have to go to an office. I don't have to sit on a train. I don't have a boss. I have clients who... Um, and I rejected some clients, um, but I have clients who understand what it is I do, understand when I'm supposed to make money, understand when I'm supposed to lose money. You know, if I lose some money, they don't cry like a baby. You know what I mean? They understand. So I, I am very blessed, but it, it took a very long time to get here, wh which makes me even more thankful to the whole thing, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I went through a period, you know, I, I, really kind of got the scent of how to make money in 79, 1979, 1980. And I'm sure people are listening to us that go, golly, do they even have that year in the history books? I don't right. even, I right. mean, yeah, I, it's crazy. But then in the eighties, I killed it early night. Then in the nineties, I stumbled, you know, so 93, 94, 95, I didn't make any money. I mean, I mean, I I didn't. I think ninety three was like minus five percent, then break even ninety four, down a couple percent ninety five, where I just was burnt out. And so, but it was tough. I mean, it, um, that was emotionally the most emotionally hard period of my life was when I just really didn't want to trade anymore, and didn't trade and unplugged the machine and didn't trade again for 10 years and went up and did other things. I actually became an NGO at the United Nations. I was interested in stuff that goes on politically and I formed a nonprofit and I became uh, an NGO with the United Nations Council on Economic Development and you know, but I, I, my wife, see, I'm, I'm 55 years. I mean, married 50, 55 years this year to the same woman. She's awesome. been remarkable, you know, fit, to, to be married to a trader for that long. Are you crazy? They're saints, Saint. absolute saints. And, and I re remember then in 2005 or 2006 saying to her, you know, I think I want to go back into trading. I think I want to trade again. And I remember where I was sitting in my house and I remember where she was standing because it was just kind of a major moment in our lives, right? Is that, hang on, go back and do this crazy thing that she knew was, you know, a tough thing to, training is a tough thing to do. Would you agree? I mean, training is really- I, I say it all the time, man. You better understand it. I say it, to, you better understand, man. This is, is one of the hardest things intellectually and emotionally this is one of the hardest things in the world to do and i mean no disrespect when i say that to somebody who is a fireman okay yep and, and i has agree to go into a burning building okay that's harder to do than this okay um i mean no disrespect to somebody who is you know walking around with a gun through through the streets of afghanistan or, or whatever the hell you know what i mean that's harder to do than this and i mean no disrespect to that but as in terms of emotionally and intellectually as a job kind of thing outside of where your life is at stake okay our lives are not at stake our financial lives are at right. stake but nobody's gonna fucking shoot me anytime soon right because of this although some people <laughs> might but um you know for the most part outside of that this is an incredibly hard thing to do you, you know, I think you, one you don't get paid. And that's why I tell people to be lawyers. I go, be a lawyer, get paid your $500 an hour. Okay. Yeah. And if you want to trade, put half of that in savings and then trade on the side. Yeah. No, you see, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I mean, 
when someone asks me, what do I need to quit my day job? I mean, you know, what they're thinking is they can put their $50,000 in an account and pull out a half a million every year like annuity. Yeah. And, you know, which is just silliness. Uh, what I tell people is you'd probably need two years worth of savings to live on in the bank. And that's not your trading capital. Your trading capital has to be money you've taken out of the market. It's not money you borrowed against your house or taken from the family trust account. It's got to be real profits that you've proven to yourself you can do it. And you just got to assume you're going to be a loser the first year. And you got to have realistic expectations. I mean, for me, that's... Here's the thing, Jason. Uh, I'd like your take on this. Um you know, when I my goal is not to make money. The reality is, is that my, the I look at my trading as not a pursuit to make money. That's my pursuit is to be excellent in all aspects of what I do. You know, I, I want to achieve excellence. I want to achieve excellence in how I manage my emotions, how I manage my order flow how I read charts, uh, how I do follow-up, how uh, how I keep metrics, uh, how I do record, how I record my trades. I, I want to break my trading down into all these little subcomponents. And then I want to see what does excellence in that subcategory look like. And in the process of trying to do that as a discretionary trader, and it may be different if you're a pure systems trader, but as a discretionary trader, I see my faults because I can't, that excellence is always just a little bit out of reach for me, right? It's just when I go and appraise myself, I don't think I've ever, I don't, I can't remember a trade that I've done where I look back at the trade and said, I did everything right. I did everything the best. I, there, there wasn't any aspect of this trade that I could have improved upon. So I guess my question to you is, do you find the same sort of thing? And if you were to start all over again, would you be a discretionary trader or would you put everything into a system? I started off as a discretionary trader. The volatility and the yo-yo effect um, I, I weren't working. Um, I systemized what I could and there's discretion on top of my system. That's how I do it. Um, yeah. I have rules. I have to obey the rules, but within those rules are, 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 are a read, right? So yeah. for example, you're asking me about soybeans. Yes, everybody's short. And then I'm telling you, but that doesn't mean anything because a lot of times everybody's short and they stay short for a very long time. So I'm not just going to keep getting in the way. So when do I get it? Well, tomorrow the WASD comes out, which is the big report for soybeans. Hopefully it's super bearish. And if it's super bearish and soybeans trade down 2% and then close up on the day, Bingo. All that, that's where I'll get long. Okay. That's the discretionary <laughs> feel to it, right? My system can't tell me that. So that's my discretionary feel. So I'm a combination of the two. And somebody once said to me, machines can do better than man, but man and machine can do better than machine. So yeah. I like to think that's what I'm doing. Um, to your point of, and I'm literally getting chills down my spine listening to you talk because it's just speaking the, the, the truth, the truth of the truth coming from the mouth of an experienced guy, okay? An extremely experienced guy. Um, why do you still trade, Jason? You know, listen, this is what I have done. This is what I have spent doing my entire life, okay? And I'm not perfect at it yet. And I'm never going to be. There's always room for improvement. So that's interesting, right? But it's what I've done my entire life. And as a competitive person, okay, I want to be the best at this, okay? Yeah. I look at people like Monroe Trout, who put up ridiculous you know, numbers, right? Return to drawdown numbers and ridiculous numbers of consecutive months in a row. When I started this new CTA five months ago, 14 out of my first 15 months were up months, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to take over Monroe Trout. Monroe Trout, they always say, put up like whatever, 75 out of 80 months were up or something like that, right? Whether I can ever get there, I don't know, but I sure as hell I'm going to keep trying 
to. You know what I mean? It's not about the money. Yes, I get paid if I am successful at doing this, clearly. And I wouldn't be doing it for free because I'm a capitalist and I have bills that need to be paid, right? So yes, I make money from it if, I, if I'm successful. But the motivation, especially now, um, is I want to be the best at what I spent my entire life doing. This has been my entire life and I can't go back now. I can't go to law school now. I can't go to medical school now. I'm too freaking old. This is it, right? So I want to be the best at, at, at what I am doing. That's what this is about to me. I, I want to excel at this whole game and I find the game incredibly fascinating. I consider myself to be a behavioralist. I come from a family of psychiatrists and psychologists. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, by nature, in my DNA, find behavior and human behavior extremely fascinating. And I find this game to be the biggest test of human oh. psychology that you could ever have. So I'm in the middle of what I consider to be the best place for my fascination. Okay. Yep. Um, yep. So, yeah. yes. People that's ask what... me that, too. When are you going to retire? You're old enough. You Hopefully, you've made enough money that you can. Of which, of course, I have. So, yeah, people ask me that. And I agree with you, Jason. I can't think of any other areas of my life that challenges me more intellectually, emotionally, psychologically. It, it, it is just, it's the thing that challenges me. And I enjoy that challenge. That challenge keeps, is just it keeps compelling. You going, like, you know, people like, yeah, why, why don't you retire? I'm like, retire from what? And what am I retiring from? What am I, I don't do? work. I woke up this morning. I'm sitting in front of this screen. I'm talking to, you know, a guy who I've wanted to talk to for a long time. And I love talking. I mean, retire from what am I going to do? Am I going to go play golf? You know, Steve Cohn said it. Golf's great till you got to play five days a week, right? Like, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm doing what I love to do. I am retired. I, I see I'm the same. I'm the same as long as I can think and I, I'm, I know my name and, uh, uh, you know, I can put two words together. And, and frankly, I, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I agreed to start this whole crowded market report and get involved with that, too, because if at some point I decide, which I, I, I think I may, if I decide to not manage other people's money anymore. Right. Yeah. Well, this yep. keeps me intellectually invested in the whole thing i will still manage my money but it keeps me intellectually invested in the whole thing that i'm trying to talk to people about markets that you know hey what do you think of the fed here well you know what i mean it keeps me invested in it and, and my brain hopefully stays alive you know i mean you, you've heard many stories of people that they retire and then they die because their brains go to sleep you know i, I can do this until the die. i always say i'm gonna die sitting at this freaking desk man you know what i mean there's a 90 percent well, chance 20 years to catch up to me is so well, i'm, I'm gonna be 20 more desk, right and there. i'm just gonna kick it right here right and that would make yeah. me super happy because right? i don't know what i'm retiring from right uh, retire yeah so you mainly you mainly do futures right jason that's, all, that's your, all, all futures yeah all futures let me so, let me just get wait hold on let me before i disappoint people it, it's just so funny because it's so on point to what you said before about what people ask you about trading so the first question people ask is what would you tell the younger trader and i think you answered that right but right on point to to what you were saying is the second guy asks um let me find it hold on in the market where you said he moved is exactly what you were saying which is what makes it so funny man in the market wizards book, he said he moved to trade eight to 26 week patterns from the one to four week patterns he used to trade in his early days. Has that changed since? Any other major changes to his trading process? Yeah. I, I mean, again, that's insignificant. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, it. That's enough of an answer for me. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. I mean, it's, that's, that's, it's whatever. It's whatever. Uh, right. I mean, Right. And, and the only reason I wanted, yeah, and I used to figure that when I was really active, I'm talking about factor as a prop firm in the 1980s. You know, we do 40 trades a month, 40 new trades, uh, 30 to 40. Um, and that was back in the commodity corp uh, period, too, where I, I, that's just too much. As I get older, you know, I can't keep as many balls in the air anymore. I mean, that's that's the reality. I, I'm not. 
<laughs> That's such I, a fucking awesome answer, man. Why did you I, go from shorter moving averages to longer moving averages? Because I got freaking old and I can't have so many trades on. I, I can't. It, it, I mean, just I, I could because have it's not about it's not about that. It's like you've said, it's not about the entry. It's about the risk management, man. That, that's what it's about. That's so yeah. Funny. That's yeah. Such, uh, yeah. Please, people, listen to this. This is gold. Whoever's listening to this. Understand that. If you're going to understand anything, understand that, okay? Understand that. It's about the risk management and the discipline and the patience. It's not really about the entry. That's the least important thing. And Peter, Oh, you, you know, it, that's really interesting. You should say that, Jason. I'm going to say something about that because you just triggered something. Please. It was, you know, my, my observation is 90% of the newbies are aspiring people. And I, I, I don't want to be negative about them. I want to encourage people to try to be. If they want to be traders, I want to encourage them to be good. But, you know, and they have to start somewhere. So I don't want to sound negative about people who are just starting out or just really aspiring. <laughs> but their main preoccupation and obsession is with trade entry. Trade entry to me is about the least important aspect of everything I do. There's Who no cares what trade you put on? It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It's it's how it's how you get out of the trade that matters, not what it's, trade it's you just, put on. It's, it's how so you get freaking, out of the trade you put on. It's just so true. You know, one of the first places that I traded, I worked at a brokerage house in Hong Kong, and I wasn't a very good broker. I, I got the job because I convinced you know all the American money started to bang into Hong Kong when Deng opened up China. So I convinced these brokerage houses, hey, I could go and call the American you know firms and. You know, get that, 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 and I was horrible. I was a horrible broker. But what I did do all day was I traded all day, okay? And there was yeah. a lady who sat next to me, Jackie Chan, who was a great trader. She had been the head of equity trading for Morgan Stanley for a while. She made a crap load of money. She took a job in this medium-sized brokerage house where I was um, just so really she could trade her own money. And her husband ran one of the big uh, one, ran one of the big institutional firms, and she would take his order flow or whatever. And she, we would sit next to each other and just trade the shit out. Of and she would do things like, she'd say, hey, I just bought 50,000 shares of this, Jason. Deal with it. Trade it. Or I just shorted 50,000 shares of this thing. Jason, trade it. It's your trade now. Yeah, do it. I'm yeah. like, well, why'd you get short? I don't know. I just did. Deal with it. <laughs> that was what she used to make me do. Yep. And like, yep. that's exactly it. It doesn't matter, man. And it's just such an important concept. And it's just, yeah. You know, one thing I saw that I, that I read in the book about you, which struck me is you don't really use VAR, which I think is ridiculous. People ask me about VAR and I go, who cares? Value at risk. Who cares? I know what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, I used it at one point just because, uh, and this is one of the one of the many reasons why I closed my original sort of big CTA was uh, you know I left this hedge fund and, and got backed by people that wanted me out of, that were willing to give me money because of my track record there. Started my CTA, I was going to be you know a big shot, and but they all needed that. Well, how do you do your risk? Where's your VAR? So we did it. We put the VAR and we put all the shit that they needed because I had this huge nut. I had a whole bunch of people working for me, and I had to have a few million dollars coming in just to cover the expenses. And so I did what they wanted me to do, right? Um, and it was such freaking garbage and all that shit. All any of that shit did was was hurt my return stream over time, right? Yeah. Um, which is why one of the reasons why I, uh, you know, I got divorced and wanted to change my life. But I, I just shut that whole thing down. And and when I restarted, um, I purposely restarted and said to people, you know, if you're not okay with me being a one man operation then don't give me money because I, I promise you I'm never going to be anything other than a one man operation. Right. And some people said, well, we can't do that. And I said, okay, fair enough. I, I wish you luck. Right. But it all goes back to things like VAR because if they know I'm a one man operation, then they know I'm not dealing with all these institutional type of things like that. All right. Either you trust that I know how to run risk. I sit in front of these screens all freaking day and night. Okay. And I'm watching the correlations all day and night. That's what I'm watching more than anything else. Right. A, correlations in the market as possible positions for me to have on, and certainly correlations of my positions, right? If you don't think that I can handle that and that I'm going to be responsible in that, then you shouldn't give me money, man. 
You know what I mean? My returns show, first of all, that I am responsible in handling my risk. Because look at my risk, right? Uh, my drawdowns, you know, I've never had a drawdown this whole period, more than 5%. So, you know, yeah. does that mean it can't happen? No, it could happen, but it's not going to go to 20% all of a sudden. Okay, it might go to 5 or 6 if my trading sucks and my system starts sucking or whatever. Then it might go to 6 or 7, and then we can have a conversation about whether we should do this anymore. But it's not going to go to 20 all of a sudden, you know? And, and if you can't trust that I can do that, then don't give me money because VAR ain't going to stop any of that, man. The value risk sucks. I, I went to business school. I learned all about the value at risk. I know the math. I understand the whole concept, right? But it, it, it's crap. I, I, I picked that up much quicker than that stuff does. That stuff is so delayed, right? Um, and, and it doesn't pick up when you when it needs to work the most is when it works the least, right? They always say when markets crash, correlations go to one, Right. Well, now your risk ain't going to pick that up until it's way too late, right? So, anyway. uh, yeah, it's always a, it's always a lagging indicator, right? Right, right. Which yeah, you it's don't, always we, a lagging. We have indicator. enough lagging indicators. We don't need them in our risk process as well, right? Yeah. Interesting. Well, we're over an hour. I don't want to keep you forever, but I do want you to tell me that we can talk again because this is a, and we don't even have to talk on camera, man. I'd like to just talk to you just because it cracks me up, and sometimes I need people to, I need to hear this from other people because. Uh, it just kills me. Some of the things you were saying in the book too about like people on Twitter and shit. I mean, it just kills me. I was very late to Twitter. I was never involved in any of this crap till about two yeah, years. Yeah, I was early, and I was only early because uh, he, I was approached by the a publisher, John Wiley. Uh -huh. This was like 2010, I think it was, and they said, "Would you ever want to write a book?" And yeah, I said, I don't know. I golly, I'm not sure I would, but I ended up saying, yeah, and I wrote the book. And then they kind of, as the process of trying to promote the book, uh, sure, they, they, to get they set me yeah. up on a Twitter account yeah, and all sure. of that. And what a crazy world! The world of Twitter is a crazy world. Well, it's but it's it's beautiful because it's humans. That that's what it is. It's humans. Someone was ragging on me just last night on Twitter. I said something, and their answer was, "Oh, don't listen to this guy. He got this wrong and this wrong and this wrong." I'm like, "You damn straight, man. I get shit wrong all the time." Okay. But yeah. The difference between me and you is when I get it wrong, I lose this much. Okay, because I don't care. Well, the other the other thing that cracks me up, Jason, is I'll put a chart up of a bottom in the market, right? Let's say it's a bottom in the market. And then six months later, it wasn't a bottom. It was a continuation. The market headed down. And, you know, I get somebody to say, yeah, yeah. Are you still long? Are you still long? I'm right. going, no, that know. is they're, such they're, ancient they're... news. My goodness. No, That's a lifetime ago. Yeah, I actually love, I think it's, I personally think it's funny because it just, you can tell who a trader is and who not a trader is, okay, right away. A, a, a trader's not going to say, hey, man, you got this wrong and this wrong and this wrong, you suck. That, that's not the question. The question is, how much did you lose despite the fact that you got all this wrong? Right. That's the question. Right. Well, I lost uh, nothing. So who cares if I got it wrong? Right. That's the kind of thing a trader says. Right. The non-traders are like, oh, you said that this was going down and it went up. You suck. Why should I ever listen to you? It's because I've told you I, I have no ability to predict the future any better than me. You should listen to me because I can help you learn how to do risk management. That's it. Place that you want people to go to find you. Well, don't come to Tucson. <laughs> right. Not in person, but but, but on the yeah, in the not virtual, in, well, in the I mean, virtual Peter, world. at Peter L. Brandt. That's my Twitter handle at Peter L. Brandt, and they can find me. And I would encourage it. This is a man who, at least from my perspective, knows what the hell he is talking about. And I have followed his Twitter stuff, and and ninety eight percent of the time, he is saying things that speak directly to me. Yeah, not, and the other two percent of the time he's saying, "Look, I'm buying this and I'm selling this," and that is not of interest to me, quite frankly. But what's of interest to me are the things that he says about markets and trading and and, and what it really takes. He's he's spot the fuck on, and there's a reason why he's spot on. Okay, it's because he's been doing this for a very long time, and he's unbiased. He's only interested in what's going to make him make money. He's not interested in the bullshit. Okay, so I would I would highly encourage. So Peter, thanks. So much for all this time, man. It, it, it was great to finally meet you. It was great to talk to you. And I really hope we get to do this again. Subscribe to the Crowded Market Report YouTube channel 
for more CMR interviews and other content from Jason.